very much for allowing me the opportunity to talk about my favourite subject. Um, if given the opportunity, I could start talking now and I would still be talking in four hours of time on this because I'm passionate about it and I hope you are too, but you probably are because you all make your living in the um, uh, lighting world one way or another, I hope. Um, you'll see the title is The White Heat of Revolution. I can't stress enough how much of a revolution the installation in this very theatre in 1881 was. It changed everything. Not just lighting, it changed acting styles, it changed costume, it changed makeup, and actually, far more significantly, it paved the way for um, the whole of naturalistic drama to be able to be brought into full fruition. Um, light is fundamental to our lives in all kinds of ways, not um, just in art and culture, but uh, as Robin said, 2015 was the UNESCO International Year of Light, of which I'm very privileged to be a, a, a member of the founding group in the UK of, of uh, setting up hundreds of events throughout the year. Um, the Year of Light celebrates light in science and engineering, light in medicine, biology, and light in manufacturing and architecture. And a bit later on, you're going to hear how the, uh, the newest and argu arguably the most important development in um, uh, light and lighting of the 21st century has been installed in this very, very theatre. Uh, a little later on, I'm going to introduce a lady called Beth Taylor, who unfortunately is uh, stuck somewhere around about the Paddington area at the moment. And she, uh, she does promise to be here, and she is the founding inspiration for the International Year of Light in the UK. And uh, she'll tell you a lot more about it. But first, I'm going to take you back uh, 130 years. Yep, 134 to be precise. In... Um, October 1881, there was very little happening to attract the attention of the London theatre goer. Um, Covent Garden, Sadler's Wells, Lyceum were occupied with their grand opera. Uh, most drama houses seemed to be doing revivals, and both the St James and the Haymarket Theatre were closed for renovation. Wilson Barrett was scoring a personal success at the Princess's Theatre in The Lights of London. And in Dublin, Henry Irving was electrifying the Irish with his classical repertoire. But, down by the Victoria Embankment, however, you're about to electrify the theatre in a very, very different way. For Richard Doyley Cart, there he is, <coughs> the idea of a brand new theatre was a dream. There was a man whose wit and kindness and sagacity and vision uh, caused an awful lot of people to detest him immeasurably <laughs> and respect him immensely at the same time. This was a man who um, uh, had an ego the size of a planet and a brain to match. Uh, but like that other great entertainer of the same period, P.T. Barnum, he was first and foremost a showman. Hart's real ambition was, uh, his first love really, was to bring about an English repertoire of light opera would, would displace the, uh, the bawdy burlesques and uh, badly translated French operettas that were dominating the London stage. He assembled a syndicate and formed the Comedy Opera Company with uh, Gilbert and Sullivan being commissioned to uh, write an opera that would serve as a centrepiece for the evening's entertainment for his whole new world of, of operetta. This was highly successful and for the next few years a uh, number of operas were performed by the Comedy Opera Company at a wide variety of theatres in London. In, a, in his capacity as managing director, he managed to hold together the, the company uh, for about five years in, in spite of boardroom dissension, fist fights over the ownership of scenery, um, pirated versions of his productions being presented simultaneously next door at the Olympic at one point. He was fed up to the back teeth, in fact, with living some sort of a nomadic existence 
uh, getting theatre performance slots wherever he could find them in the, uh, the face of the vagaries and, yes, corruptibility of the owners of the bricks and mortar. It came to a head when the lease of the Opera Comique, his, his uh, primary venue, uh, came to an end and he was presented with a ruinous and completely unaffordable uh, rent rise. Uh, he decided that was enough. Enough is enough is enough. He was going to seek complete independence. Uh, the result took just a few months to rise from a piece of waste ground by the riverside. Here it stands. The Savoy Theatre. That's what it looked like in 1881. That was a view from the, the other end of the building. And that is what it looked like when it was first opened. Very plain, but um, never again, he said, in every respect, never again would he attempt to cram 21 lovesick maidens onto a stage ideally suited for 10. It was going to be, in any respect, the very best theatre you could possibly make. Uh, the orchestra pit was going to be large enough for uh, the extra musicians, which Sullivan was always agitating. And spurred on by Gilbert, who had very, very firm ideas on production standards, coupled with a healthy contempt for the commonplace, he intended to make the technical facilities second to none. It was going to have the best taste in decoration, the finest of ventilation systems, and it was going to be the first theatre in the world to be lighted throughout with the incandescent filament lamp. The phenomenon of, of light produced by electricity wasn't new. It had been around for about 80 years after uh, Sir Humphrey Davy um, discovered his latest toy, uh, which is uh, uh, a voltaic battery of great power, could be uh, used to light up um, uh, uh, strips of platinum to incandescence. He also showed that a brilliantly blinding light could be produced between the tips of two carbon rods if they were briefly touched together. And if that light could be maintained for as long as they and the carbon uh, and the power lasted. Uh, there were lots of these in use. Um, notably, uh, for the first time in the world, in the South Foreland Lighthouse in Dover in 1858, and there were lots of flood lighting and public street lighting, but it wasn't until years later that we hear of its first use um, in a theatrical setting. Charles Keane, no sluggard here trying anything new, uh, used an arc lamp in um, an otherwise unremarkable pantomime entitled Harlequin and the Enchanted Arrow. This isn't a picture of it, it just kind of gives some sort of an idea of the, um, uh, the way he used strong beams of light for, for special effects. But fundamentally, the arc wasn't really very suitable for uh, large-scale, wide-angle lighting. It flickered, it wasn't that bright when spread out over a stage, it was a bit harsh, and frankly, to torture in metaphor, it couldn't hold a candle to limelight when it came to spotting. Another answer had to be found. The, the, the story of the incandescent lamp is a very, very long, complicated one. Uh, and I'm going to give you the very short version because there's, it's, it's a really interesting tale, but I'm going to give you the short version. Uh, the first patent incandescent lamp was made by uh, De Moyens. Uh, De Moyens. Um, despite his name, he was in fact British to the core, and the um, lamp itself consisted of uh, a filament in a uh, glass jar stuffed full of carbon. It didn't last very long. It looked quite good at the time, but the blackening of the carbon and the bulb made it completely useless after a very short time. Also, it had a bit of a tendency to catch fire at an alarming rate. <laughs> so, at the time, there were lots of people who poo-pooed the whole idea. In 1878, a whole group of eminent scientists said this, lighting homes by electricity is a problem that's not capable of solution by the human brain. <laughs> On each side of the Atlantic, however, uh, various men took this as a personal challenge. Uh, Swan and Edison, uh, these two, uh, were two, just two, of the people that were working on the problem. And they independently set about uh, passing currents <coughs> through a variety of filaments. Um, they tried everything, using all sorts of materials, um, cotton, 
carbonised paper, sewing thread, anything they could find really. Uh, metal filaments, they just simply wouldn't last. They just did, in the end, um, I imagine in desperation, uh, Edison is said to have um, plucked a piece of uh, bamboo from a lady's fan, uh, carbonised it, and used that, and actually it worked really, really well. Um, it was very, very frustrating to them. Um, they tried various kind of uh, amounts of vacuum in the bulbs as, as well. Uh, both managed to solve the problems, though, in a very similar way, as did uh, Maxim and several other nearly forgotten pioneers like Lane Fox. Um, later, there were to be many, many bitter arguments and patent suits and recriminations as to who thought of it first. The truth was, of course, that uh, everybody responded to the needs of the time and um, taking what was obviously the next technological and logical step. And as it happened, they uh, pretty soon realised that cooperation was better than competition. And eventually, they amalgamated into the Edison and Swan Electric Company, which is Edison Swan. Uh, Richard uh, doyle Carp wasn't, it seems, a, a particular admirer of gas as a medium, uh, partly from a safety point of view, after a um, catastrophic fire in Vienna, the Ring Theatre, uh, which claimed, uh, in the same year, 1881, that claimed 450 lives, a huge disaster, uh, directly uh, caused by the gas burners, and uh, partly because he had uh, strong views on the mutual incompatibility of uh, clear singing voices and fumes from gas burners. Here's another picture of the uh, Ring Theatre Vienna um, after, the, uh, after the fire. That was all that was left of it. The greatest drawback, Doyle Karp said, to the enjoyment of theatrical performances are undoubtedly the foul air and the heat. And as everybody knows, each gas burner consumes as much oxygen as many people. Incandescent lamps consume no oxygen and cause no perceptible heat. Uh, another drawback to the enjoyment of theatre was the imminent and ever-present possibility you could be burned out any minute. In the 25 years prior to 1881, theatres were destroyed by fire at the staggering average rate of one per month. The fate of a theatre is to be burned. It seems merely a question of time, said the builder. <laughs> Having seen... Uh, electric lighting lamps uh, exhibited outside the Paris Opera some years previously, which would have been uh, carbon arcs in flood lamps. Uh, Cart had been convinced that electric lighting in some form is the future of light in theatres. Now electricity has its own problems, but a fire hazard on that scale was definitely not one of them. But it's really interesting to note that it's the standard practice of the insurance companies at the time to demand a higher premium from theatres equipped with electricity than it was with gas. So, electricity it was going to be, Carp decided. So, being a man who just got on with things, he uh, contacted uh, Mrs. Swan and Mrs. Siemens and made some inquiries. At the Savoy, the electric power was initially produced in a shed on a piece of wasteland at the back of the theatre. A motley collection of steam engines were arranged to drive six large alternators like those of Siemens manufacture. The field core excitation voltage these was uh, simultaneously um, uh, generated by six small dynamos. The theatre itself was uh, wired by Siemens electrician Mr Kepler in six main circuits, uh, corresponding to the number of generators, uh, various areas being protected by subfuses. Uh, each area was initially provided with a switch. Uh, main switches for each group were also provided, and it's reported that when they were operated, a flash that resulted could be seen in the auditorium if the scene was dark, and I imagine some noise as well. The fittings themselves, they weren't especially novel or noteworthy. They were um, uh, made as electrical versions of existing designs of uh, footlights, uh, wing towers and battens. Altogether, there were 1,158 swan lamps in the theatre, 824 of which were on the stage, 
giving in total a stage light output equivalent to about uh, 3,000 modern halogen watts. Of these, 718 were above the actors' heads, uh, 50 of those were floats and portable units, and the remainder were fixed to the side wings in the traditional manner. Uh, this is a, a float here. This wasn't actually the one from the Savoy, but it's one from the period. Uh, you could probably see that it's... Uh, <coughs> oops. That's the one I want. There we are. Um, it's equipped at the side there with a kind of a handle which brought over a kind of a dimmer shutter. And there were tracker wires as well, and they may well have used coloured gelatin, uh, although very often the bulbs themselves would be uh, actually dipped. The house lighting consisted of 114 lamps, mainly in three branch brackets around the auditorium circle front. These are the actual illustration of the actual brackets designed for this building and equipped. Um, for it, it, it's interesting to note that it was never envisaged that house lights could be dimmed during the opera, uh, possibly due to the fact that reading the libretto was quite the thing during performance, and indeed the sale of those things must have been quite profitable. Um, a few things that Cart had admired, though, about gas lighting was the ease with which its intensity could be adjusted from a, a central gas plate. Uh, this is an example, again, this isn't the right one for here, this is a French one, um, but uh, very, very typical of the period. Um, actually, there's the remnants of, uh, of one, uh, I think in the Alexander Palace Theatre, I might be wrong, uh, which you can arrange to look at. Um, but um, one of the more impressive features of the incandescent lamps was that the, um, uh, as applied power was decreased, uh, so the intensity decreased, kind of more or less in proportion. Uh, Siemens Brothers and Company, who had done the installation, um, had arranged a, a series of open spirals of iron wire in a frame and connected them between the generators and each group of stage lamps. And they uh, were switched in and out of the circuit as required and acted as the first ever resistance dimmers. Uh, this wouldn't, of course, have given uh, the smooth dimming that we've come to expect today, but a series of switched steps, um, reminding me, at least when I was a beginner, and uh, the old-time chief electricians and lighting designers would use terms like uh, number one, batten reds at three quarters, floats half, perches at a quarter, full up finish. It's a direct legacy of this stepped switch resistance system. On the 4th of October, Doyle Cart allowed this advert to run in the papers as usual. The grand opening of the Savoy to the public will take place on the 6th of October, by which time it will be lighted entirely by electricity. Um, didn't quite work out like that because the following day this notice went up. Uh, the opening night is unavoidably postponed until Monday the 10th of October to complete the uh, very complicated works and experiments uh, connected with the application of electric light to the stage. Mr. Cart um, trusts that the novelty of this undertaking will be an excuse for the delay. Well, you know, like many more modern occasions, we've all been there. I think when bold steps are taken with untried technology, there were complications. The fact of the matter was that the uh, alternators would not supply sufficient power to light the whole system. It's hard to believe that Messrs. Siemens' calculations were at fault, because by 1881 they had supplied a large number of generating sets worldwide, and their experience was undoubted. Even so, it was uncharted territory for the uh, Victorian engineer electricians. They're yet to learn of some of the more unexpected effects. It's hard to see over a span of 100 years exactly where the problem lay. But at the same time, quite easy to see where it might have been. Um, as a sort of a side comment on that, I remember I designed and built the world's first and biggest uh, electroluminescent light installation, underwater as it turned out, that's another story. <laughs> I was flummoxed to find out that all these things work fine on a small scale. They all work fine individually, but as soon as you lit up the whole room and lot, all kinds of problems came up, all kinds of eddy currents, all kinds of harmonic interference, all kinds of problems with the chokes, and took a lot of sorting out, and so did it here. 
as Kant pointed out, never before had been attempted to light up so many incandescent lamps at a time. He wrote to the papers and explained that he would immediately procure an additional steam engine which would definitely solve the problem. Uh, it didn't. But the house lights, of course, for which no dimming facilities have been provided, they uh, work perfectly. It was then decided not to postpone the opening further, but to go ahead under the conditions in which they found themselves. It was perhaps a source of uh, particular annoyance to Doyle Cart that the full lighting couldn't be employed on the opening night, apart from the fact it was incredibly embarrassing to him. There were um, all sorts of other factors, amongst which was that the Paris Opera was being temporarily fitted out for the opening in five days' time of the Grand Electrical Exhibition and Congress. Seven different rival electrical systems were being erected side by side, including the Swan Siemens, the Edison, and the Maxim schemes, uh, for the benefit and comparison of the trade. Obviously, great commercial interests at uh, stake here, so it comes as no surprise to learn that all the electricians from this theatre, they act and left and went to Paris um, uh, to lend a hand. And their experience from the Savoy uh, must have been a, a, in what was the biggest fit-up ever since then, um, leaving the Savoy Theatre here more or less dry, high and dry. Fortunately, the management were in a position to revert temporarily to an older, well-tried backup system because he did have the foresight to have the theatre partly fitted for gas, belt and braces. The work was carried out by the uh, best-known name in the business, Messrs. Strode & Company, a magnificent of whose, whose artistry hung above the heads of the audience um, when they entered the theatre on the 10th of October. A resplendently glowing sunburner. They also saw not the usual painted backdrop, Um, there we go. Um, they also saw not the usual painted backdrop to which they were accustomed, but a, a sumptuous drop curtain in creamy satin set off with silk fringes. It was ornamented with two plaques of white figured silk on which were applied comedy and tragedy masks, <coughs> the, uh, the buskin and other ancient symbols of the dramatic art. Above this uh, symphony of the draper's art, they saw a matching valence surrounded by an elegantly dished top of the proscenium arch, which they later discovered was uh, meant to be a sounding board uh, to direct the voices to the back of the theatre. The seats were upholstered in inky blue plush, and the walls were lined in shades of uh, red velvet. Even before they'd entered the building, they had a series of pleasant surprises. The elegant curry, um, covered carriage entrance, large enough for five conveyances at once, led on to a very well-appointed foyer. Uh, those who had taken the opportunity to reserve their numbered ticket, found printed on the portion to be retained, a plan of the theatre showing them the way to their individual particular seat. Whilst those who were accustomed to scramble for pit and gallery places all received free of charge, uh, oh sorry, they were marshalled into an orderly queue, and all received free of charge um, or, yes, by the way, this is the, uh, showing the, um, uh, there they are, the specially made uh, brackets for the circle front, yes. There we are. Yeah, there we are. Everybody received a um, handsomely printed four-page programme. It was uh, something of a carnival there in the auditorium, this auditorium, that night. The Prince of Wales was there to give a clap to the occasion. So was John Hollingshead, who was manager of the uh, rival breakaway section, who was all too ready to pour scorn. <coughs> Gilbert wasn't there. He hated attending first nights. And in any case, he was busy, as it happened, directing the rehearsals of Princess Toto in that very rival theatre. Uh, Sullivan was present conducting the orchestra, as he always did, in the presence of His Royal Highness. And there were those in the pit in the gallery who, uh, seeing the gas bravely shining when they came in, saying, hello, Cart's pulling a fast one here. But they were soon to be disabused of the notion, however, when uh, Sullivan, 
after leading the chorus and orchestra in a lively rendering of the National Anthem, Doyle Cart stepped forward to address the audience. After a few introductory welcoming noises, he announced that uh, in the nature of an experiment, although the stage lighting system wasn't ready, boom, the auditorium would be lit by electricity. Hooray! He went on to warn, warn that the system may fail boom, due to the extremely experimental nature of the installation, in which event the gas system, a small part of which would remain alight at all times, would instantly be brought into full use. And at his signal, the gas was turned down. <coughs> with a hum of expectation and anxiety through the house. The effect was instantaneous. A start, a pause, a tremor, and suddenly the auditorium was literally flooded with a brilliant light. Not all the light it was sweetness, however. Uh, the light is far too strong, the lamps too numerous, the glare too powerful, and I found my eyeballs aching and my head throbbing, and I soon discovered that it was as imprudent to stare at an electric lamp as, as at the sun. I should say that the Savoy should be at least as well lighted with half, half the lamps. The system behaved itself admirably throughout the performance of Patience that evening. Despite the odd flicker and slight change of intensity as the steam engines vary their speed from time to time, uh, a problem that had to await uh, a solution until the perfecting of a, a decent storage battery. At the end of the performance, the public <coughs> expressed an almost unanimous verdict of success. Not only the lighting, but also the production, the scenery, the theatre, all the arrangements are bar with whiskey that was whiskey and coffee that was something more than actual chicory. Even the ticket takers and the other attendants received their share of approbation uh, for the smartness of their appearance and solicitude for the public. But also the fact they expected no tips. In fact, they were expressly forbidden to accept gratuities on pain of instant dismissal. <coughs> it was to be another 11 weeks of hard work before it was considered ready to announce the lighting of the stage by electricity. During that performance uh, time, the performances continued under gas. The eventual solution to the problem was quite elegant in its simplicity. The iron resistors were removed and replaced by a much smaller six-way <coughs> regulator. Uh, this consisted of uh, half a dozen six-position switches uh, connected to tappings on coils of German silver wire. Uh, these were mounted on a wooden flame positioned in the fly floor and were electrically connected not to the output of the alternators but uh, between the dynamo and the field coils of the alternators. The operation of these resistances reduced the magnetic flux in the alternator and therefore the output voltage and it had the added bonus that uh, it also um, reduced the magnetic drag in the system <coughs> Uh, thereby affecting a saver in prime mover power. It also provided some um, lagging in the system, some hysteresis, a sort of a, a, a portamento in a musical term in the system that made for a much smoother dimming transition. Uh, by the afternoon of the 28th of December 1881, the installation was judged to be completed and the public and press gathered to hear to see the latest wonder of the age. There must have been some fluttering in the public dovecots about the safety of the new medium. For Kant found it necessary to give a graphic demonstration. He, or rather Siemens engineer here, Kepler, and I wanted to do this, uh, but I think wiser counsels prevailed today. Uh, he produced a bulb which was connected to the power, wrapped it in a piece of muslin of a highly inflammable nature, and at a signal from Kant, smashed it with a hammer. The vacuum was broken and the bulb immediately extinguished without so much as singeing the gauze. Whether or not Doyle Cart's innate sense of showmanship tempted him to getting somebody to pull the plug out at the right minute to avoid the alarming bang as the fuses blow isn't recorded. His triumph, however, was complete. The beauty of the new light was universally acknowledged. Engineering reported that in the artistic and scenic point of view, nothing could be more successful than the present lighting of the Savoy Theatre. The illumination is brilliant, without being dazzling, and whilst being slightly whiter than gas, the accusation of ghastliness, so often urged against the light of the electric arc, can in no way be applied. In addition to this, 
the light is absolutely steady, and thanks to the enterprise of Mr. Doyley Cart, it is now possible, for the first time in the history of modern theatre, to sit for a whole evening and enjoy a dramatic performance in a cool and pure atmosphere. Uh, a Siemens publication at the time, undated, uh, tells us that um, worthy of special mention was the three colour lighting in each of the trough shaped units. The adjacent sockets were connected in three groups for the coloured lighting. In this way, it's possible to bring in a red, white, or a blue, or a green coloured incandescent lamp alternatively into circuit. Uh, lamps themselves were coloured by uh, dipping them into a, a mixture, a mixture of uh, Photographer's negative varnish and Judson's dye, although this was quite unsatisfactory uh, due to the temporary nature of the process and the shortening of the life of the lamps, and of course inevitably the loss of light from the lamps, especially where blue was concerned. Um, a more common method was to draw a coloured medium of dyed gelatin or fabric around the body of the trough, which could be remotely controlled by the trackable wires, as I showed you. Um, it can be read in reports of 1882 that the light emitted by the incandescent lamp, even at maximum voltage, had a warmer tone than gas light, and a very fiery orange could be obtained at medium voltage, and a definite red at low voltages. The richness of colour nuance of which this light is capable can be achieved at every instant, however, since the light can be regulated with the speed of lightning. However enthusiastic the uh, public and the press and the technical people were, not everybody shared the euphoria. Ellen Terry absolutely hated it. Writing in her memoirs recalls, when I saw the effects on the faces of the electric footlights, I entreated Henry Irving to have the gas restored, and he did. We used gas footlights and gas lines until we left our theatre for good in 1980. Too. To this, I attribute much of the beauty of our lighting. Um, uh, I say our because uh, this was a branch of Henry's work in which I was always his principal helper. The thick softness of gaslight, with its lovely specks and motes in it, so like natural light, gave illusion to many a scene which is now revealed in all its trashy glory. Now, those specks and motes, the thick softness, was in fact due to the heat haze arising from the uh, floats and the gas and a large amount of water vapour suspended in the air. In this equivalent to a modern hazer, all the joints in the flattage and the ancient stains on the floor must have totally disappeared. And even in this, the, the dry makeup of the reputedly beautiful Ellen Terry, which we now know was consisting of a, a maquillage of Fuller's Earth, rice flour, white lead, red lead, powdered, anti uh, powdered antimony, rouge, burnt cork, must have looked good enough under the lights, under the gas lights, for her complexion to be described by contemporary writers as radiantly natural, needing only a quick stroke from a rabbit's foot to restore a healthful glow. One can imagine her horror when she beheld the effect of the faces in the electric footlights. She used dry makeup to the end. Ellen Terry's horror of seeing her face under harsh electric light was shared by the entire acting profession. I'm not surprised looking at these makeup <laughs> examples there. But the, the point source effect of the bare lamps creating multiple hard shadows was completely unforgiving, though. I mean, vainly may. Uh, powdered and plastered dames of a certain age attempt to conceal the wrinkles and the other ravages of time um, in the fierce light that now surrounds them. Uh, so a German actor called uh, Ludwig Leichner experimented with a variety of things, a mixture of vermilion, yellow ochre, zinc white and lard, gave much more subtle effects. Later, uh, the heavy grease that gave the uh, new makeup its name was replaced with much lighter oil. By 1896, an inspector's report, which I only received a couple of days ago, thanks to Roger Fox, uh, shows uh, new generators having been installed, uh, which also served the Savoy Hotel next door, and that uh, liquid dimmers had replaced the regulators. There were also six arc lamps in use on the front of house, three either side, and two on the exterior. 
Scene painting and props too underwent a sea change, like the, uh, the coming of high definition TV. Every detail, every crease in the backcloth, every speck of dust on the scenery, every painted on doorknob was revealed as a fraud. And the golden crowns revealed themselves as nothing but gaudy tinsel. Although the vast painted cloths from people like the Lutherberg could look absolutely beautiful, much of the painting technique they used was actually really very basic. New techniques rapidly emerged, which went a long way towards realism. In fact, when they were designing the theatre, um, the cart had arranged some electric lights to be rigged in a workshop, and the scene painters were able to paint some cloths under electric lights so that they could see what the electric light was going to be like. And in fact, it came as a huge surprise to them. Under gas, they had to uh, exaggerate some colours, particularly the blue. Now they didn't have to do that. Uh, they could paint in much more naturalistic colours. They found they'd have to paint in much more detail. This coincided, this whole new business of scene painting, um, with a whole new movement in uh, written drama from, amongst others, people like Chekhov. Strindberg and short, harsh, gritty, realistic drama to match the searching realism of the incandescent lamp. Arguably, of course, this uh, new realism could have languished in the doldrums for a long time in the uh, context of a theatre dominated by old school actors like Irving and Ellen Terry. However, in this new mood for change, there was nothing to hold it back. It is at least conceivable that the coming of electric light kick-started the entire realist movement. Far from being a boon and a blessing, though, the coming of electric light to the theatre was nothing short of an earthquake, a cataclysmic blow to everything the Irvings and the Terrys and the Trees and the Harkers of the era stood for. They'd built themselves a world of theatre which all the components balanced out. There was no doubt that they were the magic makers of the era. Within the conventions of their world, they were free to move and experiment in any direction they wanted, and indeed, they would claim they didn't have any restriction at all. But the coming of electric light demanded they change many of their basic premises. The illusion of the lighting, the illusion of the makeup, the illusion of the scenery and the costume, all had to be relearned. Their first reaction was to reject it altogether. This in no way meant they were diehards with heads firmly stuck in the sands of past successes. Far from it, much of the best of their lighting was yet to come. Irving had already been responsible for material advance in use of light since the days of Deleuthenberg, Garrick's designer. But he'd looked at the electric light and he'd not liked what he'd seen. Others, though, seized on the new medium with ferocious delight. Already, by the time the Savoy had settled, the Alhambra Theatre had installed auditorium lighting to a limited extent. On the continent, theatres were being equipped at a furious rate, while in Britain, all new theatres that were nearing completion or planning at least considered uh, converting to electric light, and many did as a matter of course. For a while, the invention of the incandescent gas mantle threatened to slow it down a little bit, but by the mid-80s, the improvement to the accumulator allowed the electric light to be completely steady, flicker-free, and more or less secure against loss of power. And this eventually cleared the way for theatres to take the step of abolishing gas and oil as a primary source of lighting in their theatre altogether. So that's the backstory of the incandescent lamp. It's the mainstay of lighting, the fundamental source of light for nearly 130 years. It all started here. Not in this particular auditorium. This auditorium was rebuilt after a fire. But on this stage, in this area, in this very place, you can practically reach and touch the revolution, the technology that it produced. And in, in the hands of the masters, an entirely new breed of lighting designers, there's very little the incandescent couldn't do. It still has a unique place where low light levels, uh, strong textures and misty looking gobos and things like that are needed. Despite accus uh, accusations to the contrary, it's actually quite energy efficient when you take into account the energy, the carbon and the human cost 
involved in the mining, the processing, the manufacturing, the distribution, the recycling, it actually comes out better than many of the alternatives. To me, it's a tragedy that the laws have been passed to make it illegal. If the alternatives were any good, the lamps, of course, would have passed into disuse by now of their own accord. So I don't know why they had to bring in some laws. But modern technology is with us, and it's fantastic. The things you can do now, the things you can do. And that immediately brings me to saying thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening.